Welcome to the Nashara podcast, a podcast on change and legacies in Italy. I am your host Diego, and in our 13th episode of this series, we will discuss the Italian economy post war and the role of state enterprise. Between 1950 and 1963, Italy experienced a period of economic growth unprecedented in its history. GDP more than doubled, and industrial production rose by an average of 8.1%. Whole new industries emerged, exporting Italian products all over the world. Fiat sold more cars in 1967 than any other European companies, and Italians for the first time could afford fridges, washing machines and TVs. It was by all accounts a miracle. The Italian economy had gone from a largely war-torn agrarian economy to a modernised and industrial one. What other countries had achieved in nearly half a century, Italy achieved in less than two decades. The Italian economy seemed modernised and industrialised, with huge firms pumping out everything from steel to typewriters. But behind the scenes there was continuity. The fascist anti-publici didn't burn up in war, but survived and were used extensively both for economic but also political gain. State enterprise, a large fascist legacy, was expanded massively to serve the very same goal that fascism had in mind, political control. Old business practices and local family firms still worked behind the scenes. The legacies of continuity, if you want to put it that way, are numerous, and to this day shape the current economic realities of Italy. As stated before, the Italian economy at the end of 1945 was a mess. Allied strategic bombing and German plundering of industrial machinery had crippled heavy industry. Agriculture also took a hit and daily calorie intake dropped massively. Yet the economy rebounded quickly. Infrastructure was repaired quickly and by 1948 the manufacturing industry was back to pre-war levels and by 1950 the same was for agriculture. High interest rates hurt the economy but restored confidence in the lira and people began to save and invest. Another key factor was aid. Italy received around $2 billion worth of aid between 1943 and 1948, which provided food and fuel, and martial aid provided another $1.5 billion. American aid helped to rebuild damaged plants, but also helped restructure basic industries such as steel and cement. Italy first acquired a modern steel industry, which provided Italy with cheap and plentiful steel. Italy joining the EEC allowed its industries to find new markets, and especially allowed the steel industry to find cheap iron ore and coal. However, the greatest and most important factor that fueled the economic miracle was state enterprise. State enterprise was crucial in the development of the Italian economy. State-owned firms provided cheap steel and cheap energy and allowed the private sector to boom. By 1971, over 350 firms were at least partially state-owned. They were run as businesses and made handsome profits. State-owned banks and credit institutes controlled cash flow, and provided cheap credit to many private firms. The great utilisation of state enterprise stems largely from Catholic social principles and the legacies of fascism. The Codici di Camandoli, drawn up in 1943, helped to create an ideological basis for state enterprise. At the heart of the principle was a belief of Catholic solidarity mixed with socialist ideals. It was a form of anti-capitalism but without communism. This reflected heavily in the role of the state-owned enterprise. They were created to promote general welfare through the creation of jobs in circumstances where private capital wouldn't invest. Thus, this included taking parts in activities that would lead to losses such as the development of the South. These were called social costs, or oneri impropi, and only a state-owned firm was willing to take on these costs. However, these codici did not create a state apparatus, but rather dictated how to use it, because the instruments of state intervention already existed. One of the greatest legacies of fascism are the over 300 enti that were created during the 30s to achieve political control of the economy. Many survived the war and became crucial in developing the economy. What also survived was the leadership. Managers under fascism controlled and shaped the upcoming miracle, a clear sign of continuity in the Italian economy. The enti helped to kickstart the Italian economy at a time where private investment was very low. The Liberal Party and most industrialists had lost a lot of legitimacy and money due to fascism, meaning that they were unable to invest. They were also incapable of posing any shifts to state intervention. Thus, the very same entity created by the fascists survived and were actually expanded. They helped Italy rapidly industrialise. The two most famous and important of these firms were IRI and ENI. Now, IRI, we talked about a couple episodes ago, played a crucial role in post-war Italy. It was under the control of the Council of Ministers and helped develop Italian heavy industry. Like under fascism, IRI dominated huge areas of the economy from car and engine manufacturing to banks. Its subsidiary, Finsinder, which makes steel, held over 50% of the capital stock in the steel industry by 1951. 
Finsider's steel investment program helped modernize the steel industry alongside American aid and increased steel production by 70% from 1948 to 1953. However, Italy's greatest contribution to the Italian economy was through infrastructure. It was decided in 1955 that the construction operation of the autostrade or motorways would be given to Italy. By the 1970s, Italy would have the second largest motorway system in Europe, and a previously geographically disunited country was unified. Where motorways existed, industrial plants soon followed. Along the Autostrada del Sole, or the A1, which runs from Milan to Naples, over 600 new industries opened up. Thus, Italy played a very key role in supporting the steel industry and building up not only the road network, but through derived demand, the car industry. Italy made sure Italy would become a nation of car lovers. However, Italy was eclipsed in importance by a certain company that was also born under fascism, Eni. Eni, or the Enti Nazionale Idrocarburanti, was the state-owned energy company that became an economic powerhouse in the 50s and 60s, having a tremendous economic, cultural and political impact. Its origins lays in the fascist agit, founded in 1927 to find oil and gas during Mussolini's autarkic push. Eni played a very important role in shaping the modern look of the country. Large pipelines, refineries and petrol stations all created symbols of modernization and industrialization. By 1962, Eni had created a fully integrated supply chain and employed over 56,000 people. It provided cheap energy to Italian industry that fueled the miracle. Eni succeeded due to the managerial skills of one man, Enrico Mattei. An entrepreneur before the war and a resistant leader during it, he was ambitious and had impeccable credentials. In 1945, he was involved in the Dies Chi and was chosen by the CLNA to wind down Egypt. The liberals, who were in coalition with the DC and the Americans, both wanted Egypt gone. The Americans wanted it especially gone to allow the American oil companies to exploit Italian oil reserves. Through fighting an intense vanguard action, Mattei managed to save Egypt while also drilling for oil in North Italy. The drilling in the Po Valley, around the Po River in northern Italy, may not have brought much oil, but it found huge deposits of natural gas. It was gas that fueled the miracle. By 1952, 2,000 kilometers of pipelines had been built, spanning all over Italy, but especially in the north. Eni itself was created in 1953. It would reorganize all the state's activities in the field of crude oil into one firm. Eni was given shares of many smaller firms and reorganized by Mattei into subholdings such as Agip for scales, Anik for refining. Energy was effectively nationalized. Mattei had turned natural gas into a competitive advantage that soon allowed Eni, born in the fascist era, to hold immense power. Eni became a state within a state, especially in relations to foreign policy. Eni created new contracts with countries that allowed host nations to the ability to become involved in production and benefit as equal partners. It soon began extracting oil in Egypt, Iran, Morocco, Nigeria, and many other countries. By 1962, Eni produced abroad 30 million tons of crude. However, his greatest and most significant foreign venture was the 1961 deal with the USSR to import millions of tons of crude. It allowed Eni to drastically reduce its dependency on imported crude oil and provide 21% of all Italian demand in the middle of the Cold War. Eni had just defied Cold War logic. Eni was something new in the Italian business world. It was modern, aggressive and well-managed. Its refineries dominated the local landscape and its half-dog, half-dragon logo was emblazoned over new, bright and well-stocked petrol stations. Their products were advertised masterfully. The petrol produced by Eni was hailed in advertisements as the Super Corte Maggiore and La Potente Benzina Italiana, or the powerful Italian fuel. It tapped into an Italian sense of national pride that many Italians felt they had lost. Choosing Agip, the firm that ran petrol stations, and Eni was not only choosing a petrol, but choosing Italy and its expanding wealth and prosperity. Eni, first apart from fueling the miracle, became one of the first truly Italian model firms alongside Fiat. It implemented new managerial styles and rationalized production. Its creation after the war resembled an in Italy industrializing, moving forward and modernizing. It became the metaphor and background to which Italians played their dreams of prosperity. However, state enterprise was not only used to expand the economy. In the very same way the fascist regime used state enterprise, the new mass parties of Italy would utilize the state enterprise for their own political goals. Fascism had left Italy a large system of state intervention in the economy, and not only was this kept, it was also expanded massively. This was the greatest continuity of fascism in my opinion. Whilst other countries were privatizing their industries, the Italian government expanded state enterprise, nationalizing everything from electronics to even the cake industry. The Dici and other parties, but mainly the Dici, believed that it could strengthen its power and hold on civil society through the use of state-controlled enterprise. State enterprises could be controlled and forced to build factories in certain areas to increase local support in favour of the Dici. Eni, for example, became the industrial arm of the Dici. 
The Qi in the post-war years was still very weak. It had a large electorate, but a small membership. The electorate was loyal not to the party, but rather the spiritual values it embodied. The Di Qi became dependent on external bodies, such as any to provide jobs and patronage to increase support. It allowed the Di Qi to expand its clientelistic network all over Italy. Every single square inch of public enterprise was shared amongst the main anti-communist parties, and soon even the communists were brought into this cosy system. Everything from Rai to air traffic control was shared out like this, like slices from a gigantic cake. It turned the Italian state into a paternalistic state, willing and able to pay attention to everyone whilst also creating dependencies on the parties themselves. Dependencies equal control, which equals power. The DC thus soon transformed state enterprise into one of the core pillars holding up its regime of Italy. However, as one can guess, this leads to huge levels of corruption, and is what slowly killed state enterprise. Industrial policy soon became a focus on a contest for spoils, the defence of local interests, and the rescue of ailing firms. Dynamism and managerial flexibility allowed state-owned enterprises such as any to thrive and succeed, Political control undermined this completely and put political considerations over basic common sense. Public enterprise was run with expansion as a target. There was no strategy and soon this became a handicap for the Italian economy. Financial independence was soon lost and firms thus became prey to political expectancy. A vicious circle of increasing dependency was created as politicians became wealthier and more powerful whilst state-owned firms were forced to take on ever more uneconomic choices. It will transform from the spearhead of expansion into the sickbed for inefficient loss-making firms. The DG could not allow any large or medium-sized firm to go bankrupt without threatening its support. Thus, state-owned firms, and especially the successful ones such as Eni, were forced to take on these failing industries. Eni, for example, was forced to take on the smoking ruins of the Italian textile industry that in the long run helped to nearly bankrupt the company. Iri reported a 2 trillion lire loss in 1980, as it was forced to take on Italian shipbuilding at a time when Italian shipbuilding was very uncompetitive. Steelworks were built and other expanded at the same time when Western Europe was experiencing extremely low steel prices. Political control had replaced common sense with clientelism and corruption. Its legacies left Italy economically weaker and with a strong and continuing legacy of corruption. State corporations were key to industrialization and modernization and helped Italy finally achieve the status of a modern industrialized economy, but the firms themselves fell prey to the same old push for political control. Old fascist doctrines were used and led to serious consequences. Italy had industrialized, but had it developed? This question is best represented by the attempts to industrialize the South. The South remained one of Italy's biggest economic problems. In 1951, southern income per head was at 90 pounds per year, and 25% of southerners were illiterate. Unemployment was sky high at around 50% in some areas. It had many features of an undeveloped country, yet made up 40% of national territory and had over 17 million people. Something had to be done, and the answer was a massive state intervention program called La Casa per il Mezzogiorno, or the Special Fund for the South. It was a fund that focused on everything from agriculture to steel. However, it focused very heavily on heavy industry and industrial development. Industrial investment in the South went from 50% of the t national total in 1951 to 44% of the national total in 1973. State-owned firms were directed to put 60% of their new investment in the south, and heavy industries sprung around the southern countryside and cities. Taranto, as described in later episodes, got a huge steel mill, which is still in operation today. Yet, the political control of the economy came to haunt it once again. Industrial development was used as more of a way to dislodge local interests and powerful landlords and replace them with party officials than a way to completely modernise the south. Factories were thrown up randomly and came to be known as cathedrals of the desert, when the Italian economy faced crises in the 70s due to inflation and lost competitiveness, the state continued in its merry course, expanding steel production and chemicals. They even forced Alfa Romeo to build a plant near Naples in a venture called Alfa Sud, which bankrupted the firm. The South had gained modern industry, but it did not create an industrial base. Factories produced few jobs, and employment actually fell. Workers and materials flowed down from the North, and there was little evidence that there would be a takeoff in local industries. In fact, what happened was the opposite. Local industries such as consumer goods industries found themselves without state support and suffered heavily, with many going bankrupt. The South's industry was first relegated to isolated industrial plants that employed very few people and were not integrated into the South's economy. These heavy industries eventually soon began to falter and die, meaning the South, after all this effort and money, lost an industrial base. By 1971, income per head was still half of that in the North. 
To combat this, the state instead turned to welfare and pensions to increase income, which tripled in the 25 years. Invalidity pensions and welfare was used to prop up consumption in the South, and a huge effort were put into education and health. Most Southerners could read, and had better healthcare than ever before. The South seemingly modernised, but it was more of a facade. It had modernised but it hadn't developed. It had all the traits of a developed country with high consumption and good health care, but it had the industrial and governmental base of an undeveloped country. The South went from an agrarian economy straight to a post-industrial society without properly industrializing first, meaning to this day the South remains undeveloped compared to the rest of Italy. However, there are much darker legacies. The first one is a legacy of corruption. The heavy focus on welfare led to the creation of an administrative economy with public resources being in the hands of a few leading politicians. This led to the creation of a new class that acted as a mediator in a patron-client distribution system and perpetrated large amounts of corruption in order to gain electoral support. The other legacy is organised crime, the Mafia. In a society with a weak industrial base and in an economy dominated by politics where the flows of funds to support consumption is the only form of public intervention, Organised crime quickly became one of the instruments of regulation and distribution. Local industrial projects, especially failed ones, were soon hijacked by organised crime. This is clearly seen in Gioia Tauro. In the 1970s, construction began on a steel mill, a coal power plant and a harbour to supply both of them. The local environment was devastated but the furnaces remained empty. The port, however, was completed and was soon infiltrated by the Nendrangheta, who turned it into one of the major entry points into Europe for cocaine. Funds destined for earthquake victims and reconstruction were diverted to local crime bosses, who not only became wealthy, but also in some places protected by local party bosses such as in Sicily. The Mafia could get voters out. The South is a perfect example of what political control of an economy can do, and the trails of legacies it leaves behind. Italy might have industrialised, but large areas of the countries were left behind, undeveloped and forgotten. There was also continuity in the business practices. The model of large corporations failed to truly latch onto Italy. Whilst Italy tried very hard in the 1560s to adopt a modern and American model of corporation, this had limited success. The Italian economy produced few successful large firms. Most firms encountered difficult problems of inadequate management such as the Italian chemical industry, which expanded too quickly and got itself in a lot of debt. As much as Italy industrialised, the model of big corporation did not fit Italy well. Behind the scenes, business traditions and family firms continued to exist and thrive. In Italy, firms actually got smaller since the 1950s. Weak investment, labour militancy and an undeveloped stock market meant that large corporations were rare and less supported by the state. In Italy, 23% of firms have 1-9 to nine workers, while only 3% of American firms have the same amount of workers. While state enterprise floundered, small family firms boomed. Italian capitalism, instead of supposedly modernising and following the American model, became a large-scale niche capitalism based on strong craft traditions. Small firms became world leaders in very niche products such as a certain bolt or machine. These firms flourished particularly in central and northeastern Italy which had strong legacies of sharecropping and the family acting as a productive enterprise. Whilst Italy industrialised, small family-run businesses ran as usual. Even large corporations such as Nutella are still run by the very same families that always used to run them. In fact, Italy ran and still ran to this day a large subterranean economy or black market. At the height of the miracle, there were about 2.5 million unofficial workers who worked mainly at home or in small workshops. They were non-unionized and paid no taxes and sat outside the social security system. Whilst in many other countries, shopkeepers went largely extinct, in Italy, shopkeepers, many of them unregistered, rebounded. Thus, but beneath the scenes, Italian industries and economic life continued on just as it had done for decades, in the shadow of larger corporations. However, the greatest continuity existed in business practices. Cartels and monopolies continued to run through Italian society like veins. The legacies of old Italian craft guilds and their restrictions still impact Italy today. Everything from taxi drivers to glassmakers was and still is cartelized. Ordini or colleghi, uh, professional bodies whose membership is essential if you want to work in a said field still dominates the Italian job market. There are more than 30s of these and they regulate access to wide-ranging professions from ski instructors to radiologists. Restrictive practices in the Italian economy and society still continue on, strongly even as the country industrialised quickly. Thus, this kind of goes back to what we said about the South. It may have industrialised, but it maintained a lot of elements of an undeveloped country, especially in economic terms. Italy industrialised at an unprecedented speed during this period. It acquired for the first time in its history a modern steel, chemical, energy and automobile sector. 
Its economy grew and its people became wealthier. Italians consumers drove Italian cars made from Italian steel fueled by Italian petrol. Italy had finally joined the group of modern industrialized nations. Yet pervasive legacies of the past continued. The anti publici of the fascist era fueled the growth and state invention simply changed from a fascist tool to a Christian democratic tool. The fascist use of political control was replicated in the Republic and led to devastating results for state enterprise in the South. Italy largely rejected the large scale capitalism found elsewhere and resorted to the creation of small firms and its own niche capitalism. Italy checked off most of the checklists for a modern economy, and yet large areas of the country remained undeveloped and restrictive old business practices continued to dominate. Italy gained the appearance of a modern industrial country, moving forwards into the future, but beneath the surface, continuity continued to shape Italy's destiny.